So I'm Lisa Young. I'm a spacesuit conservator at NASA. Uh, my title is objects conservator, actually. Um, and I have training in conservation from the University of Wales with an under degree, undergraduate degree in historic preservation and archaeology from the University of Mary Washington. Um, and Kathy and I have been working together for decades on the spacesuits, uh, doing research and preservation and history of the suits and the collections, but uh, striving to find the best way to put spacesuits back on display at our museum and other museums uh, so they can be enjoyed by the public and be explained by you all in the galleries and not locked up in storage. And there's a lot to that, but um, that climax of our activity uh, happened last summer when we were able to get Neil Armstrong's spacesuit back on display that many of you have probably seen. And so um, without further ado, I will let Kathy explain a little bit about the collection and how she decides what's in the collection and um, why I get to work on the great things in her collection. Hi, I'm Kathy Lewis and I'm curator of spacesuits and international space programs at the Air and Space Museum. I don't know how many of you I've met really bad with names. I know that's a bad thing for an historian to be, but I am. Um, I, uh, we have a, the largest collection of spacesuits in the world, and I've seen other collections, so I can say that with confidence. We have suits that we've largely, our collection has come to us from NASA. We've long had a right of first refusal, or at least priority, and receiving spacesuit and, and spacecraft components from NASA since the mid 1960s. We have a collection of suits that date from the years in which the Air Force was working on the concept of pressure suits. Um, these are uh, test suits and prototypes that um, the Air Force passed on to NASA. We have flight suits from the 1950s. And of course, we have spacesuits from um, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. We have all of the suits that were walked on the surface of the moon are in our collection. Um, we have prototype suits of so suits that never flew, um, uh, suits that were built to test concepts um, to make a better spacesuit. We do not have an ISS EMU, extravehicular mobility unit. We have components of it, but we don't have a whole one. And that is why the only one that, ones that we have are the, um, the models um, that we have out at Hazi in downtown. Um, we're working to fix that. We are also looking for examples of suits that are going out and being tested and prototyped right now, including launch and entry suits. You all probably saw, witnessed the launch of the Dragon um, demonstration launch um, the week before last. Um, and you saw those new suits, those are launch and entry suits. Um, we are also looking to obtain what um, the new exploration suit that NASA is working on for going on to the moon, to an asteroid, and to Mars. So that, that's my not so short introduction. And I've just sent Augustine a photo of Lisa having some fun in our, <laughs> of our research trips um, to ILC Dover. So I, if Augustine, if you see that coming in, I don't know if it got to you. Um, you can put I that up. Embarrassing, I had embarrassing photos of Kathy I could have sent as well. <laughs> um, very professional photo of you. <laughs> so one of the big, um, I'm, I don't know if we have a format to follow Kathy, but I'm just going to talk till they have a question. But um, one of the big problems with our collection is that, you know, the suits were used to do work and live in space and were meant for the mission that they were constructed for and meant for mostly a one-time use um, until recently. So many of the suits come to us, you know, in a used condition, but not sort of worn out, I would say, um, if you were looking at things in a perspective of what kind of condition they are in. And 
They are made up of strange materials that conservators often don't have a lot of experience conserving. Um, our museum is at the forefront of space and aero conservation efforts uh, internationally because we have the most complicated collections and we've put the most effort into studying and researching and finding out how to preserve our collections. But plastics and mylars and Velcros and modern metals and all of these materials um, are just being, still being um, able to be understood better, uh, their chemistry and how we can preserve them. But the unfortunate part about the spacesuits is we can't take them apart because the mere fact that they're adhered and sewn together and have wear from the missions on the materials and have stressed, are stressed in different ways which add to their condition stories um, represent the actual use and mission that they came from. So we don't want to erase any of those historical stories. So a lot of our work has to be done um, now examining the suits using uh, modern technology such as CT scanning or X radiography or um, performing uh, tests on them so that we can determine the best way to preserve them without taking them apart, um, which is very difficult. So you know, most of the aircraft in our collection, we can take apart down to the nuts and bolts and put them back together and um, they're fine, but that's not the case with the spacesuits. Yeah, that, that Lisa brings up a very important point. We've got these spacesuits that are complex machines like an aircraft, um, but they, they can't be taken apart because of the way they were put together. They were sewn. Everyone's heard the stories of the seamstresses at ILC, but they were also glued. Um, they have compression seals around the wrists and all of the, um, the hardware. So they're, they're impossible to take apart. And I think, and Lisa's research has done a great job in helping our understanding of the best way to preserve them. That's why the spacesuit collection is um, at the Hazi Center. It's in a secure storage which is climate controlled um, at the best of the optimal temperature and humidity to keep those those various components. These are all synthetics, so they are going to deteriorate from interacting during their deterioration. So we're, we are at the cusp of implementing what we've learned for storage into what we will display. And you, as you've seen, if you've seen the Neil Armstrong suit, it's in a specialized case that um, comes close to reproducing those storage conditions for us. Yeah, and one of the interesting things that Kathy and I have learned um, in the past few years working on the suits and almost recently is that while we equated a lot of the condition issues with the suits as being aware from use or uh, post-flight damages that could have occurred when the objects came to our museum or were held onto by NASA before they became a museum object and were cared for in the way that we care for things. Um, many of the things that we're seeing change color or uh, show up on the suits or a stain that appears is because the materials are aging and they're from pre-flight repairs that were made to the suit. So. One of the interesting things about the Kickstarter campaign we did um, to put Neil Armstrong's spacesuit back on display, and the thing that I think I love most about that campaign, and Kathy will probably echo that same feeling, is that we got to interact with a lot of different people that came together to donate money for that campaign, but mostly because they wanted to help preserve the collection. And one of those people had held on to documents that were really important to the time when Neil Armstrong's spacesuit was made. Everybody thought they were lost. And he read about the campaign and sure enough appeared with this box of files in his, from his garage and helped us discover some of the things, uh, missing links to the stories behind the suit and what had happened to it. And also the, the activity that it went through when it was made, which is really important to our research. Um, they documented every time they changed a zipper or they had to use a different adhesive because it wasn't working or um, a scratch that was found in the outside beta cloth was actually just repaired and they still used it on the moon. So um, a lot of that really helped to 
uh, helped us more to determine what we were seeing. And then moving forward, we had a much better understanding of a lot of the suits in the collection. I can just interrupt for one quick second, Lisa. One question we had submitted earlier was, when you restore the suits and working on the suits, do you see a lot of evidence of particle collisions on them? Um, we do get asked this question a lot. There is lunar dust embedded in the outer fibers of the fiberglass um, beta cloth material and they're angular and sharp and they're embedded there. They're not gonna leave. I mean, they don't come off when we surface clean the suits or handle them or anything. But um, as far as I know, and Kathy can correct me, um, all the studies they've done, both of the command module and the suits themselves, um, there has been little evidence of them finding impact from particle damage in the sense of moving particles, like a meteorite or uh, particles flying through the air, which was mainly what they were trying to protect themselves from. And yes, that's, I, I, that's correct. Um, what the damage that has been documented over the years to spacesuits has not been primarily caused by um, small particles impacting the suit, but has been secondary damage. Um, and they've discovered this most often um, from gloves interacting with the exterior of the International Space Station. The space station was designed to have handholds so astronauts could go out and repair, repair the space station, replace parts. But what they found is that over the years, and it's been over 20 years now, the space station hand, handles are becoming sharp because they have been eroded over time by these small particles and they've had, um, have developed sharp cutting surfaces. So we've seen damage in gloves being cut through. And in fact, they had to change the materials that they were using on the exterior of the gloves to protect the astronauts' hands. Um, they went from using Kevlar, which is really wonderful for stopping a bullet, but not so great for stopping a knife. And now they use um, a, another substance that they apply and they trowel on to the exterior of the glove um, that is much better and much more effective in stopping um, sharp um, damage to the surface of the glove. And I see Jenny, Jenny McIntosh has asked a wonderful question that I, I always forget to mention. Yes, a space, the definition of a spacesuit is a, a personalized form-fitting mini spacecraft. Um, that's what its function is. It keeps a human being alive um, when they are not inside the safety of a spacecraft or if a spacecraft systems have failed for any reason. That's why astronauts wear launch and entry suits during takeoff and landing. Those are the two most dangerous, perilous periods of a space flight. And um, a spacesuit meant to operate as backup inside the spacecraft is very different from a spacesuit designed for an astronaut to operate outside of the spacecraft in open space or on another world for an extended period of time. Yeah, and Kathy um, also brings up another point um, when talking about the space gloves and the evolution of the gloves and how much work NASA still has to do to change those gloves. Um, and they're constantly evolving still. They're, they're not, because they have reused the um, ISS suits for a number of years, it doesn't mean that they're static. But in, another important factor about our work, which I also love, is that many of the current um, industry experts, the engineers at NASA and the folks who build spacesuits at ILC will interface with us a lot and actually come back to see the collections because the um, lunar dust that we talked about and the evidence of whether or not uh, a micrometeorite has struck the suit or caused damage is really important to them and especially is now important when they're looking at going back to the lunar surface again. Many of the current people employed by NASA were, are not, were not alive during the Apollo program. They have not seen a suit firsthand um, and we're getting more and more requests to work with them um, to let them see our collection and learn from that and that's part of why we have the collection. That's probably the primary reason is to preserve these suits so research can continue and the space program can build upon them. And I want to ask one more question. This one comes from me. You mentioned beta cloth. 
and Kevlar versus beta cloth. So is it still technically correct to say that the outermost layer of the spacesuit is, does contain Kevlar or should we call it beta cloth? Well, the ISS suit that you have is actually called ortho fabric. Um, it is a version of beta cloth, but it's a different version. Uh, the white fabric with the little yellow um, stripes in it that you see. Um, Kevlar is not used a lot that I know of in the suits or on the outside of suits. Uh, there's another material called Vectran that they use. Um, and like Kathy said, uh, these more thicker layers that they're um, troweling onto the suit or applying to the outside of the suits. But um, most of the materials from Apollo to the EMU that you all show during your activities have carried over, but they're a little bit different. Um, mostly because they're not gonna be in contact with lunar surface materials and they're not having to walk or stand in the suits like they did in the Apollo program. But just to go into the history of beta cloth, that is the one material that was designed specifically for the space program. And um, NASA had commissioned Corning and Owings Merrill at the time to develop a fabric that was um, a fabric of fiberglass, which was a, a relatively recent material. Um, that would have fibers coated with Teflon, thus allow it to be cut easily, manipulated, sewn, and adhered together. The, and that is what beta cloth is. Now, there, as Lisa mentioned, there are a whole range of beta cloths now. Um, and there is a lab, a blanket lab, it, at Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland that specializes in producing the blankets that go on the exterior of spacecraft. They made the blankets on the exterior of the Hubble Space Telescope. They do this as part of the testing and preparation of a spacecraft, which is, you know, a, a metal can containing experiments. Um, and they produce these blankets with, um, they can use a beta cloth, ortho cloth. They have special versions of beta cloth that have um, magnetic or conducting um, metal threads running through it to prevent, prevent a spacecraft from being impacted by ranges of radiation or even if it comes to close proximity to another spacecraft it won't have an impact of, it won't be um, it the metal fibers running through the beta cloth are in effect a degaussing machine, sort of like putting a metal shroud around, a separate metal shroud around the spacecraft. So it, it doesn't have any sort of impacts on electromagnetic um, mechanics. And one day, Lisa and I are going to go back to Goddard one day, <laughs> visit there. Um, they promised us samples of, of the materials that they use and, and just to give us an idea of what their, their judgment is when they create a blanket for a spacecraft, which will have an impact on, you know, you may have different covers for a spacecraft. You want to want different um, surface layers on spacesuits um, that go to Mars than the type of materials that they used for the moon. Um, we learned a lot from the Apollo experience. Uh, they will apply that knowledge, but when we do, um, better Mars sampling, and if we have a Mars return sampling, I'm sure that spacesuit designers will be very eager to find out what the properties are of the Martian surface and what they have to protect the astronauts against once they know that. Yeah, and even the top of the uh, Space Shuttle Discovery has these blankets uh, sewn on them uh, in position together like a quilt. And uh, they have a ceramic coating that they've added to the top of the blankets. So if you look at them in the space hangar, um, that was done so the blankets could survive reentry. Um, and there's a woman who sews all these materials and blankets at Kennedy Space Center, who's recently retired. Um, but she has a lot of knowledge on it and came up with the patterns to make those uh, blankets and stitch them together in such a way that they wouldn't uh, shear off the shuttle when they were um, when they were being used. And her group of uh, seamstresses that they have that worked it there at Kennedy to sew all these earlier blankets are called the Sew Sisters. 
So if you want to look them up on the internet, they're very interesting. Um, she's currently using space materials to make masks for people in her spare time. Um, she goes around the country lecturing about her activities at Kennedy. But I mean, it was really uh, an amazing outfit. And now most of her work has been automated on these current sewing machines they've designed, but they used to do all this by hand. There's another question here from Caroline who's asking about um, designing suits for women. The current um, EVA suit that NASA uses is um, the EMU, and it was designed originally during the 1980s, and it was the company ILC Dover, which made it, was mandated to be able to have it as, as a modular suit. The components could be reusable, but it, they, it could also be configured to fit every everyone between a woman who was in the fifth percentile in size to a man who was in the 90, 95th percentile. Just given a general range, that's about a five foot tall woman to a six foot tall man. Um, these were sort of NASA's estimates at the time of the range of fitting. What they hadn't done beforehand and what no one really had done beforehand in the 1980s was the honest comparison of women's and men's anatomy. And there's certain things that um, they didn't account for. Uh, women tend to have longer torsos, but they can range in arms, arms length from any, any arms length. Um, and though having a longer torso or shorter legs really doesn't make a difference if you're not walking in space, having that, uh, the different sizes in torsos and the range in sizes in torsos um, was much more, much, much different um, for women and men. The other problem they had was the first astronauts they used to size these suits were all men. And there's certain ranges of motion that women have that men don't usually have. And the common, um, it, and now the common example that the NASA presents, the astronauts they used for were men and they were not capable of pushing their elbows together and holding their elbows together in their arms like this. So when they designed the suits, they thought that was the norm, that you couldn't get your elbows together. So they designed a hard upper torso that had a wider gap um, or had that hard panel so when women got into the space suit, they couldn't get their elbows together either. Well, you know, if you have a range of motion that you're experienced with, these are very athletic and uh, accomplished people, um, that's awkward, awkward movement. So for this, the, the first um, planned all women spacewalk, the problem was that the women had an assigned task um, and they had, um, both of them had experience. Um, they could adjust um, the sizing on the spacesuit to fit them for some things that they had previously done on the outside of the space station. But given the assignment that they had for that time, those spacesuits that were ready, the hard upper torsos that were ready, weren't sufficient, weren't adequately, adequately sized for them in that case. Um, they got a bit over their skis when they started leading um, with the press releases about the all women um, spacewalk um, because they didn't figure out, oh, well, we're gonna have to go back and remount all the hardware that is on this fiberglass hard upper torso and go back and do the testing. Well, that takes about two weeks to get a spacesuit ready. So even though they had the size suits up there, they didn't have the time to do it. Now they were able to compensate for that and do the, do the all woman space walk later, but they you know, really have to take in all of these factors. You know, what are you going to be doing? Are you just going to be turning a, a ratchet wrench up there or are you going to have to grip something and you wanna be able to grip something comfortably and with your normal range of motion as opposed to trying to feel awkward and compensating, it's like having shoes that don't quite fit, or even, you know, riding a bike. If you have a, if you uh, ride a bike for long distance, you want a bike that has um, handlebars that fit your shoulder composition. Um, anything that makes you uncomfortable, 
for a long period of time is going to make you tired and less efficient. Yes, three. There is actually a small um, size EMU, and I understand that it has never been deployed to the space station. But the, um, I mean, sorry, hard upper torso huts. Um, they have been, um, they have sent all of the hard upper torsos um, that they're planning to use to the space station. There are a couple of them that are still in um, the neutral buoyancy lab um, at, at Johnson Space Center. Yes, that's Caroline. So I just thank you. And that is very interesting. And uh, you said range of motion is a challenge, but is there any other great or what is the biggest challenge you think of wearing a spacesuit in space is? Well, the gloves are the biggest challenge. Um, the gloves are really hard. You've got to protect hands, um, but you also have to have a range of motion. And a pressurized glove is really hard to move around. Um, you, you have all that pressure on, on your hand, keeping your, your gases and fluids inside your hand, but you're pressuring, you're moving it around in the vacuum of space. So it's, it's very difficult. The glove is very hard. Um, and it's not uncommon to get hand fatigue over a period of time. Um, the, um, uh, so designing a glove has been this iterative process with the Apollo astronauts. They based the glove design on a dip mold. Um, they adapted what had um, been the process for creating rubber gloves for, for household cleaning um, to the astronauts. They now do a digital um, sizing of gloves for that inner bladder, the polyurethane green bladder that you have on the carts. Um, but you also have to have a restraint system that ties that glove down. Um, there's a very intricate restra restraint, restraint system on the gloves now for the EMU, and you can see all the threads, and the astronauts can, can bring the glove down to fit their fingers. Um, they want to be in a neutral position, but they also want to be able to be able to flex comfortably. Um, Every few years, NASA does have a glove competition, um, and they go to universities and schools throughout the country who submit their ideas for making a new glove. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to learn about how spacesuits work and also how the human hand works. Um, hands get very fatigued when they've been in a glove for a long period of time. Um, people forget it wasn't, you know, it's only a little over maybe a century ago that even surgeons used gloves. They, and they fought against it at the time because they felt they needed the sensation, the tactile sensation in order to be do, able to do a good job. And it's really only been about 40 years that surgeons have gone to double gloving routinely um, for surgery. And that causes even more fatigue in their hands. And that's really the point of exhaustion for surgeons. So imagine you're out in space trying to perform mechanical activities and your hands start to hurt. Um, that's, going, that's a limitation to the activity. Um, the other issue that has come up that I, I really didn't appreciate is that um, astronauts get hungry. They have a, a drink bag. Um, and they can get fluids while they're out in space and performing a spacewalk. They don't really have a mechanism to eat something, to get a snack. I mean, even if you're, you're running a marathon, you have, you have gels and, and snack bars and everything else, and you can get a snack to refuel. Well, if you're out there in space, you really want to have something to bring your, keep your blood sugar stable. And if, uh, unless you have a question, Augustine, if no one else has a question, um, one of the big questions that Kathy and I get often at the museum is why don't we have more spacesuits on display? And we started talking about the need, um, the need to 
control the space uh, suitcase that we made for the Armstrong suit. And that was one of the big advances with our research and the Kickstarter to be able to get that suit back on display. Um, we had to really go out of our way to re-engineer how things work in a display case at NASA. Um, so that has temperature and humidity control, as Kathy mentioned. It also has a filtration system. Uh, most of these spacesuits that um, are aging and all the materials we've mentioned continue to off-gas even after 50 years. The plasticizers and chemicals are still being released from the materials into the area around them. Um, so not only do you have to design the spacesuit case to not have any bad materials itself, um, which is why it's glass, but we want, we want to make sure that the, the air coming, the gases coming off the suit are moved away from the case interior through a filtration system. So this, the case ventilates um, and in the, um, to further that along, because the suit has so many layers and there's an intricacy to getting a mannequin inside of it because of the pressure suit zipper and the difficulty in trying to get um, a suit to stand upright, we actually have a mannequin system now that has a filtration system through it. So the mannequin in the Armstrong suit is being um, fed clean air through its interior skeleton, uh, moved into the suit materials, and then over time it will help move those gases outside of the suit and into the uh, display case area, which is then filtrated further. So all of that was very difficult to come up with. Um, it's kind of like we're testing the impossible right now. And we hope to do that for other suits coming up, but um, we also know that some of the earlier suits don't have as many um, of the issues that the lunar suits have. They don't have the same weight problems. They don't have um, as many layers as the Apollo program. Um, and they don't have an unstable rubber bladder material um, because they were made from different materials. So um, with that hope, we are trying to get more suits on display at NASA in the new galleries uh, downtown that we're redesigning, and then some more at the Udvar-Hazy Center. But that's why we um, have a sort of limited amount out. Uh, the other big factor is light. As you all know, and we're always talking about the light damage that um, could be caused to the suits and the materials. Um, that's why we have the Armstrong suit right now in a place in a museum where we feel that it's getting limited light so we can control that. But most of our buildings, both at Hazy and downtown, are very lit. So putting spacesuits on display has been a very big challenge for us because um, unless you're in the Moving Beyond Earth gallery or, or one of the side galleries and the content doesn't really fit, there's no way to really display spacesuits out in the open galleries. Um, so I just thought I'd bring that up in case anybody's wondering. I know you probably get that question from the public. Um, but that is, and we did a STEM in 30 um, show a few, well, maybe six months ago now. It seems like a few months ago over the winter with, um, with Marty and Beth. And we explained a lot of this because we were downstairs in the space hangar uh, in front of the Irwin suitcase, uh, which is at the base of the Saturn V ring, and uh, explained some of these things and what we look at when we display spacesuits. Uh, a few more questions has come up. One, about the inside the helmet, two questions about inside the helmet. Once, I, I remember being told that they actually had a granola bar or some sort of fruit leather at one point. Is that something I heard that wasn't true? And the other question is, do they have, we've also heard that they've had Velcro inside the helmet to scratch their nose. Is that also true? Okay, the food, the food port they did have but it was designed mainly to have used as a food port inside the spacecraft if they were using the spacesuit to keep an astronaut in isolation. And it was a, it's a common complaint now because they don't use it for eating while in space. You can't open it up. Um, and they, they don't have any sort of carrier mechanism. They do have that, that drink um, pouch that is usually full with, of water that they can drink from, but they don't have a way to get food inside um, the spacesuit when they're out in space. Um, the Valsalva device is taken from a scuba diving device. On the Apollo helmets, it is a hard um, 
sort of a dove winged, um, hard plastic dove wing device on the, on the base of the inside of the bubble helmet. And yes, it was done that to scratch their noses, but more importantly, to relieve pressure so they could hold one side of their nose and, and blow out on the other so they could um, alleviate um, pressure inside their, their heads, sort of like, you know, when you do on it, what you do on an airplane. On um, the current um, bubble helmets on the inside of it, it is not um, a hard plastic, but it's a piece of soft plastic that Velcros onto the base of the, the helmet. And that's just because they have to replace it every time an astronaut goes in it because they're reusing those bubble helmets. But you can use it to scratch your nose and also you can use it to, to relieve the pressure um, in your ears by holding your nose closed. Um, I wanted to ask, um, answer um, Brandon's question about using Neil Armstrong's suit. Of course, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. Can't do it. Um, just not just because I'm the curator and Lisa is the conservator and we would come after you, but also because of the material, because the materials have gotten hard and stiff. Um, Adam Bradshaw, who is our mount maker, who made the the display mannequin for Neil Armstrong's suit, started out with Neil Armstrong's body measurements from when he was being fitted for the spacesuit. Um, he started out with those to make the, the mount, but he had to go down and make them smaller because the suit has become stiff over time. And I also want to point out that we as a people are much larger today than the astronauts were in the 1960s. They were very lean and wiry and, you know, 150, 160 pounds tops. So very few people could fit inside any of those suits made in the 60s and 70s. Um, and even with this 95% this range, there are limitations. I understand the, the booth size for the ISS EMU is a 14. Well, you know, you, it, there are many people with a larger than a size 14 foot. Um, fortunately, they don't have to walk around in those boots with, that are too short, but um, it, it's not completely comfortable. Um, and as far as the seals were cons are concerned as to whether it would function, that's something we'll never know. We don't reseal our suits. Um, they appear as though they're sealed, um, but um, just because of the delicate nature of those seals, um, we don't want to close it up. We don't want to create that microenvironment and Lisa, take it from there and you can go on with that why we don't seal our suits. Well, like I said, the materials are still off-gassing. So anytime you reseal um, the materials and leave them in, in connection with one another, this, those gases will build up inside the suit. So even though we put ventilation in the Armstrong suit and we're watching to see um, how this goes for a little bit of time, because like I said, this is a new display for us. Um, and we did a lot of scientific research to discuss support the display, you know, we always learn from anything we do um, and we have to make sure that it's going to work. And uh, the public really wanted to see Neil Armstrong's spacesuit, as I'm sure you all do, uh, back together. So we have not displayed the suits with their helmets and gloves on for many years and have um, gotten criticism from the public um, and a lot of questions about that. And so when we started this whole uh, revamping of the mannequin system and rebuild of our display, we made the decision that there wasn't a reason why we couldn't position the gloves and helmets to look like they're attached to the suit, but not actually attach them. So that was one of our primary goals with the new mannequin. We really wanted to have it appear that Armstrong suit is connected together, uh, but we have spaces between the connections and you don't see those underneath the fabric. Um, overlays on the helmet and the glove gauntlet. So that worked out nicely for that suit. Um, some of the earlier suits don't have that fabric overlay and it would be a little bit more difficult to trick somebody. Um, but uh, for right now, we're just, um, the we've made special inserts that were 3D printed to uh, hold the mannequin together and allow the gloves and helmets to rest where they are on a mount. So uh, we could do that. 
And to answer um, the question from uh, who asked this about why the suits are white, yes, they are white to reflect sunlight and radiation. You don't want anything that absorbs heat when you're out there in space and you're going through cycles of day and night. Um, you know, you have 90 minute days. Um, you these in the sunlight, you can get up to um, 250 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade minus 250 degrees. So you want um, something that effectively reflects the sunlight. And that is why the EVA suits are white. So the next question from Jess is if the mannequin has a name or if it's named Neil. Um, we refer to the suit as Neil, but I know that's not a good reference and I catch myself sometimes. We have not named any of our mannequins or parts of them. Um, so, no, it does not have a mannequin name. I don't know. Has Do we know if Adam has named the mannequin? Or <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think he wants to talk to it anymore. <laughs> it was a long, difficult project, so. <laughs> uh, well, we're on the topic of Neil Armstrong. Uh, we had another question about how it looks visually different from David Scott's. Apollo suits, the different valve placements and the boots were different. Does that mean that there was a evolution of the spacesuit even within the program? Uh, one program as um, what I meant to say, only through the evolve, uh, sorry, evolution within the Apollo program itself. Yes, that's, that's very astute observation. Um, they are different suits. Um, in order to accommodate astronauts sitting in the lunar, lunar roving vehicle, they had to redesign the suit so the astronaut could bend at the waist, um, bend at the hips and torso. Um, so instead of having a zipper that, that ran from the base of the neck all the way down the back and up the crotch, which made it very awkward to bend to sit down, um, they redesigned the suit to have a radial um, a zipper that went around the torso of the suit. So it allowed the designers to put in rubber convolutes that bent and they produced the A7LB as opposed to the A7L, which was Neil Armstrong's suit for the lunar roving vehicle missions in Apollo. Um, it is the A7LB and not the A8L um, Apollo. Seven is the seventh iteration. L stands for ILC. Um, because of contractual obligations, if NASA had wanted a new suit and a new comp, um, they would have had to have a new competition um, for the second generation. So they named it as a subset of the A7 um, L suits in order to get around having to recompete and go through that whole rigmarole once again and to return to the original contractor and say, make these modifications. The world of government contracting is very complicated. Um, I'm very glad I'm not in that side of the world. And on a more uh, technical note, the, uh, the rubber formula had changed by Apollo 15 to allow them to be working and moving on the lunar surface for longer periods of time. So the rubber engineers by that point had discovered an antioxidant that they could add to the blend of the rubber, uh, which was not available or um, able to be accomplished in the earlier missions on Apollo. And that allowed for the flexibility of the rubber longer, um, the, the input of this zipper system that Kathy talks about, and then um, the gloves and suits by then were able to, to be a little bit more flexible. And to this day, they are more flexible. The antioxidant has actually survived any um, long periods of oxidation after use. And we do see a big difference with the suits. Um, one of the other things added to Scott's suit is the red uh, commander stripes, which they didn't have in some of the earlier missions. Um, that was a different material. And then I think they changed the flag printing process by then because the earlier uh, flags were printed on beta cloth and then they changed that after uh, some time with the suits. So 
there are a number of little changes as they evolved through the programs and they continued to evolve through uh, Apollo 17. So it's amazing how they can do that even within the Apollo 1 program itself. And speaking of suit evolution, one of the other questions we had submitted earlier was, what are some of the difference between a suit created to be an, on an EVA and suit to be used on the surface of another planet or asteroid or moon? And I'm going to tack on another question, which was, and how will privatized space travel change suits as we know it? Well, as I, I alluded to before, an EVA suit outside of a space station isn't meant for walking. So there's not a, much, a lot of design attention paid towards the boots or the lower torso. You're basically using your feet and legs as leverage to sort of slide across the space station, but you're not, you're not walking, you're not um, trying bending over and picking up things. Um, for a, a suit that's exploring another world, another surface, you really have to make that suit to match best the surface you're going to be um, exploring. With Apollo, we knew some from, from robotic spacecraft, uh, some things about the surface of the moon, but we didn't know a lot. Um, the, that Apollo 11 mission was considered a purely engineering mission. They had a contingency action that they would get a lunar sample. And if, if things were completely different than what they were expecting, they were just going to take that lunar sample and go back home um, and then rework things. So that's why Neil Armstrong stepped out first. He got his contingency sample. He tested the um, the degree to which the um, lunar lander had sunk into the lunar surface. They didn't know really how soft it was going to be. Um, they did additional studies. The famous photos of the footprints of, of Buzz Aldrin were done not just to have a wonderful photo opportunity, but were to study the depth at which he would leave an imprint on the surface of the moon. So they'd have an idea just how soft that surface is. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, NASA is hoping to do a sample return from Mars just to get that kind of information about the Martian surface. When they decide where on Mars they're, they're going to land humans, they have to know, you know what the surface conditions. They know that Mars is much rockier. Um, the suit is going to have to be sturdier. They know that Mars having even that thin atmosphere is prone to dust storms. They have to find a way to protect the astronauts from the dust storms inside their suits, but they also have to find a way to prevent the astronauts from bringing dust into the habitat. Um, with the Apollo program, they vacuumed off the suits after they came back into the lunar lander because they didn't want to contaminate it. But lunar regolith is much more aggressive than they had thought in, in the um, late 1960s. And it adhered to the suits. Um, we still have lunar dust on Neil Armstrong's suit. So there are all sorts of factors going into that. Now, as far as commercial um, suits, they still have to answer the same problems, the same technical problems um, that, that NASA suits are. And it's sort of, um, it's not completely commercial. I mean, they're, they're dealing, they're using the same information and NASA derived knowledge um, that people have, have um, learned from over the decades. And there is a, a common pool of engineers, spacesuit engineers, who've been working on these problems. They're not, they don't all work for NASA, but they're various places throughout the country, University of North Dakota and MIT or two, um, University of Maryland has a suit lab as well. Um, so these universities and, and there are also private companies who work on these issues or try to translate um, deep underwater diving um, suits and their knowledge from that into space suits. So these people are coming together. There is this explosion of opportunities for space suit design um, and it, it's a career that's sort of neat um, just because you, you're dealing with materials, you're dealing with human bodies, so you, you're, 
you have to be very conservative, very cautious about new designs. And you also have to be concerned about ergonomics and comfort. Hope that answered the question. Uh, it answered lots of my questions. And since we only have a few more minutes, I'm going to do hopefully some easy ones because a lot of the questions we get on the floor have to do with weight and cost of the spacesuits. So. <laughs> weight. Um, it varies. Um, for the Apollo suits, it varied from man to man. Uh, the suit, the base suit itself is about 80 pounds, more or less. Um, it's the backpack, the lunar personal life support system, which is, is waiting for us to um, have somebody retrieve it on the surface of the moon, in the case of Neil Armstrong's, um, which weighs a lot. And that variation of up to about 120 pounds depends on how much oxygen was loaded in it, um, how much water was in the liquid cooling garment. Um, the current weight for um, the EVA suit is um, about 250 pounds. It, um, of course, it's operating not at one six gravity, but in microgravity, but you still have to um, maintain control over its mass because the mass is the same. Cost. Cost is another apples and oranges comparison. The cost of Apollo suits were anywhere between 200 and $250,000 for the early suits, the A7L the bees were about 350,000 because of the advanced design. Um, that seems like a little, but you also have to remember that each seat in the spacecraft for Apollo had five suits made for it. Um, the primary crew had a flight training and backup suit, and the backup crew had a training and backup suit. That's true for the first part of Apollo. After a while, they started training astronauts in, in previously made suits, and they also um, used, um, previously used, not flight, but previously used training suits for the Skylab program. So they didn't make as many suits in the A7LB as they had in the A7L. Um, I believe the most recent cost I've heard is two and a half million dollars for the EMU. But that too is sort of blurry because the suit itself is made as a modular suit um, with various components. Um, ILC contributes new components as old things wear out um, over the years and especially the gloves, which are the, on, the last um, personalized component of the suits. Um, so that, that $250 million is sort of tagged to each hard upper torso. There were originally 12 and there are now 10 hard upper torsos manufactured. Um, NASA's currently configuring an exploration space suit um, and they're trying to put that together right now. And this will be the prototype um, for any suit that goes to the moon to Mars, to an asteroid, and what they will do once they've considered um, what the components are and what the systems they're going to be using on the suit will be, they will then um, submit that for bidding and um, to private companies to manufacture and supply NASA. Great, well, those are wonderful answers. Hopefully for you out there, you now you have your answers. That more money that you that at least I have in my wallet at the moment. And since we only have three more minutes left, I'm gonna end with probably something that's very topical at the moment and probably more directed for you, Lisa, is how to best clean the suits we have on this on on the teaching collection suits. How do we best clean them to protect them um, as well as get rid of bacteria and stuff. Yeah, I mean even though those are what we term as model suits. They're still made of some of the similar materials as you all have no, know, and they were restored by ILC several times. Um, and that costs a lot of money. So my um, advice is that you probably handle them with gloves the most of the time that you touch the fabrics because they will get soiled. Um, 
and to vacuum them off regularly. So vacuuming, you know, brings dust out of something. That's how we clean all the aircraft on the floor or in the shuttle or anything else. Um, vacuuming is the best way to remove dust and you can use a HEPA filtered vacuum. I can get you um, the name of one that we've discovered for textiles in the lab recently, which is a lot less money than the ones we were buying um, and come from a nice company. They're even local. And um, it just will pull the dust out. If you do stain the materials, um, they can be cleaned off, but you have to use a surfactant, which is like a soap. Um, much like we're experiencing now with washing our hands and all the information in the news, um, the way a soap works is it surrounds the dust particles and then lifts it off the surface of the material. And then that leaves a residue, so that has to be rinsed away. So we don't really advocate scrubbing a suit with the material, even though it seems stiff, um, with any kind of rag or um, pad or brush because you will drive the dust or stain further into the fabric. Um, so if you have particular problems with the suits, I mean, I know you all have asked me in the past, um, send me what's happened or send a quick picture and I can try to help you walk you through it. Um, but even though, like I said, so the public is obviously touching some of your materials, I think, is that right, Augustine? Yeah, that's correct. We, we encourage them to touch gently, but touch nonetheless. Yeah, so you're going to get a lot of, um, and I don't know how you're going to do this now. Maybe this is a blessing that they won't be able to touch them. Um, but, you know, you can use non-chemically um, impregnated cloths to clean them off where the public is allowed to touch them. If, if you have to use a sanitizer, it will impact the um, material. So if you're going to go to like Clorox wipes or something, it will impact the spacesuit materials and I don't recommend it. But uh, there are some safer um, cloths, cleaning cloths out there by companies that um, advocate not using chemicals in your houses that we've been starting to use in conservation. Um, and um, you can use those to clean the surfaces quite easily. I will admit that I abuse, I use um, Lysol wipes on the inside of the bubble helmet, just because it, it, it is overwhelmingly gross and um, potentially contaminating, but we're not going to be using that anymore, I don't think. Um, I don't think we should let people put it on their head any longer. No, no, not going to happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you just have to, use, so a lot of con conservation is really common sense. I mean, if you would not do it to your household items, that you really treasure, I would not do it to something in the museum field. Um, and that goes for anything in your house. I mean, you're not going to throw your best dress that says to dry clean it only in the washer. Um, so, you know, materials react different ways to different uh, solvents and waters and cleaning. Again, if you watch the STEM and 30 video, we actually talk about cleaning spacesuit materials. And I had uh, the children rub dirt into the surface of materials that are similar to what you find on spacesuits and then tried to tell them to remove it. And we went through an exercise on that. Um, that can be mimicked by your explainers if they wanna do that. And um, I know before Maureen Kerr, when she worked at the museum, we did activities for um, the state of matter activities that I would send out to sixth grade science classes across the country. And that also involved a cleaning, um, cleaning activity. One of the things I love to use is cosmetic sponges. Um, there are these little white sponges you buy to remove or put on makeup. I'm not sure because I don't do it. Um, in the grocery store, they're like silicon and they're very soft. And, it, and we actually cleaned the entire surface of the command module with them. You might want to know. Uh, it took us 500 hours to clean that before it left for the tour. Um, but they're really used in conservation a lot because they lift dirt off um, very easily. And you can also see when the surfaces are dirty. Um, so they're wonderful to use uh, in cleaning, and I have lots of little tips like this we can talk about. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I hate to end this wonderful conversations on germs and grossness and all that fun stuff, but thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you so much, Kathy.